Hey, lovebirds. Welcome to the last episode of August, which you all know by now is Podcast Appreciation Month, which means that if you are getting a lot out of this podcast, and I mean like you're actually looking forward to this podcast and it makes a difference in your life, then I'm asking you to make a monthly contribution to this show. And I'm not asking for a lot. I'm asking for the very least $3 a month, which doesn't sound like a lot, but which a lot of you are probably balking at. And I get it. I mean, we've come to expect podcasts to be free. And the reality is that this podcast costs money and takes a tremendous amount of energy to produce. And I do it because I love this work and I love to learn about emotional intimacy and how I can be a better lover in every sense of the way and the word. And also, I need your support, financial and or otherwise. So if you are in a position to send some money my way so that I can continue to do this work and to release episodes like this one with the title of Dating with Terminal Cancer and other episodes where I explore the complex and fascinating and incredibly important concepts around love and how we love. I need your help. Go to thelovedrive.com forward slash join to make a small but incredibly meaningful contribution to my work and to this show and to whoever already donates. Thank you so much. I see you every month. When I look at the little email that I get from the donation service. It reminds me that people are putting their money where their heart is. And I can't do this work without you. So thank you, everybody, so much. Here's your episode. They're suddenly saying, I think you're attractive. And that helped me keep living. And I think the thing with terminal illness is it's all about continuing to live and not starting to die. And that's the big struggle. Your cancer is terminal? Yeah, terminal. Hey, everybody. Welcome to The Love Drive. And today, it's a special episode with a friend of mine who is dying of breast cancer and who also is dating people and has to tell them that she's going to die. Some people aren't into that, turns out. That's okay. And some people are. So we talk about the struggles of dating with a terminal illness, and how do you talk about it? Also, how do you support somebody who's dying of a terminal illness? This is simultaneously a very sad episode because my friend isn't going to be around for as long as I would want them to be. And also, she's amazing. In her joie de vivre. It's the first thing that came to mind. And also in in the amount of gratitude and joy that she has. This is a person that is living in the moment. And it's obvious. And it also really puts our problems in perspective when we hear someone else's story. My name is Sean Galanos, and this is The Love Drive. Welcome to Real Love Stories. I have an idea. I have an idea. You ready? Yeah, I'm ready. We're going to start. Okay. Where does this story begin? I guess the story begins with me moving to San Francisco 
and getting involved in non-monogamy and dating and kink and all the magic that is romance in the city. And then me getting breast cancer. Oh. <laughs> and when did this happen? Um, I think it happened two ish years ago. I try not to remember the dates because that's something people get weird about. People get weird about the dates? Yeah, like cancer people. They're like, it's my cancerversary and it ruins their whole day. Oh, right. So you have a general idea that it was a few years ago. Yeah, I and think that, it was March 2017 ish. That's good. <laughs> and that's good enough for you. Yeah, I don't care. And what has happened to your exploration of San Francisco kinky, polyamory, open lifestyle since then? How do I start this? I was a geek as a kid and I never felt hot or sexy. So I liked the part of going to a party and dressing up really slutty and then getting, you know, picked up because of how I looked. And it was a very shallow thing I was interested in. Like, what is it like to be a hot person? Go on dates, have people tell you, oh, you're so attractive and make out with them in a hot tub um, and then never see them again. And it just became weirder to do that when you're bald. <laughs> mm. So I went on a date and it was very clear I was in cancer treatment. I had no hair and I was in a hot tub and this guy was like, oh man, you must be able to work out during chemo because you're so fit. And I was like, that is such a weird thing to say. <laughs> people's shallow interaction with my disease became less fun. I realized I only, I wasn't really interested in the random hookup because it wasn't easy to be just your basic, basic bitch, which is what I was trying on before. I was like, oh, being a basic bitch is kind of fun. Part of getting an illness like this is I really needed to feel normal and part of that was like feeling attractive in relationship and that became more important because you have I have a huge scar on my left breast now um and so anytime I'm involved with someone I can't fake like it's not there and so it's about and when you get involved with new people you're exploring each other's bodies there's there's attraction there and I want to feel that and so I think part of that is that femme identity did stick. Like I feel, I, I like feeling cute. I like feeling, feeling sexy. And that's here to stay. I don't think the hyper, you know, I'm not going to wear makeup every day. I, I like when folks are attracted to me and that's nice. And during cancer, it's very hard because your brain is telling you like you're so much less than you're, you've lost your hair, you've lost all these things that you associated with, with who you were and what you look like. And you have to redefine all of that for yourself. And I think it's interesting that the people who do get sick and don't date have a way harder time than the people who jump back in the saddle um, and do date, because then you get this feedback from the world that isn't involved in your process like it's not your partner who's been with you through it all and knows he's obligated to tell you you're hot it's a random person who's come into your purview and they're suddenly saying i think you're attractive and that helped me keep living and i think the thing with terminal illness is it's all about continuing to live and not starting to die and that's the big struggle your cancer is terminal yeah terminal it's pretty wild. So either I'm going to die of it, which is the likely option, or I'm going to die with it. But I'll have stage four cancer when I die. Mm. Yeah. Do they tell you like a life expectancy? You know, they don't because you're your own fragile flower. <laughs> um, but if you read it online, my disease had a, has a life expense expectancy of three to five years. That's not very long. That's not very long, but 
my oncologist has convinced me I'm a fragile flower, a special flower that's going to live for longer than that. He talks a lot about like my disease is a certain way. It's in my bones only. That's good. Like there's a thousand ways that I've stayed on the, the best, best side of the terrible ship that is terminal illness. So I haven't gotten to the point where they're like, okay, it's progressing. This is very bad. We're running out of options. I've gotten to the point where they're like, you'll take these drugs and then we'll find new drugs and we'll keep you alive for alive and not suffering horribly for a long time. So that's kind of the weird limbo I'm in. Does it have anything to do with all those sweet workouts that you're able to do? I don't, I, I, no one agrees. So there's not enough connection between the quality of life people who are like, eat good food, eat vegetables, work out, do all these things. And the people who are like, take these drugs. Those people don't talk really. Like integrative medicine so new. But I think I think it might have to do... I certainly think that my lifestyle has had a large impact on my quality of life. And, and I think it would be short-sighted to think that that doesn't contribute to longevity. Sure. I mean, because what I've seen, what I've seen is people decide that they're dead and then they die. I was sort of being facetious. It was like a comment connected to like hot tub guy. But I'm happy to know that actually, yeah, the way you are taking care of yourself is leading to a higher quality of life. Totally. And probably has a pretty big effect on your confidence. Oh, yeah. I feel like all of that stuff makes me more attractive. Like I never thought eating vegetables would make me feel so hot, but it does. <laughs> it's it's really all about eating color. I know. Eating the rainbow. I thought it was a silly fit trope, but it's not. It's the truth. Eat the rainbow. Eat the rainbow. <laughs> so how has dating been since you've been diagnosed? During treatment was a trip. Um, oh, wait, wait, can you tell me about during treatment? And yeah, what, I guess, what are we talking about when you say during treatment? During treatment, when I say during treatment, it's funny because I guess I'm in treatment forever now. But I guess I, I consider my cancer story as having two stages. The early stage, so pre-metastatic and post-metastatic. So pre-metastatic, they were like, we're going to cure you. You'll never have cancer again. You're such an easy case. Um, but what it meant is I did like five months of chemo. And when you do that, like your hair falls out and your fingernails stop being attached to your body and all of these wild things happen. I always describe it as kind of like you have a car and you have to drive across a desert. It's like a Mad Max desert and things start falling apart. Like the mirror gets smashed off and you just keep going because you don't need a mirror or the windshield gets shattered, but you break it out with a baseball bat and keep going. So you're driving this like really busted vehicle. So by the end, you're very busted. Like, like, oh, I'm getting hot flashes. Oh, because the chemo shut down my whole body. Or like, oh, sex is painful. What's that about? And the doctor's like, oh, you're in menopause because the chemo has wiped out your your ovaries. And you're like, what? <laughs> so funny stuff like that would happen. Like I would have, I had a bunch of lovers during chemo. Um, nice. Which was awesome. There's no way to feel hotter than like <laughs> having your lovers come over and your roommates are like, what you have chemo lovers. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> uh, but it was fun. And, and it took your mind off of it. Like having folks say you're hot was the best. Um, when you're dating, though, and you have a illness or something like this, it's very challenging to be a good listener. So something I feel like I'm very good at in relationship is, is holding people's stuff. And I started dating a guy who was new to non-monogamy. And I was sort of his shepherd, which to this day, I like swear I'll never do again. And I always do it again. Um but he was complaining to me about how all of these ways that he's dating people are difficult and all this blowback he's getting. And at the end of the day, I was just like, I have cancer. I don't give a fuck about your problems. And I think that becomes very challenging about dating. Like you need to date people who can handle and carry their stuff because you don't have any space to, to really be 
oh, like you could be supportive, but to a point, like if it's not balanced, that's what I notice. I notice that if like a lover's laying a lot of stuff on me and not listening to my experience, because cancer is a black box. No one wants to ask about it. And so lovers tend to like share their stuff, but not be curious about you. And that can be very painful. It sounds like it puts things into perspective. It does in a big way. And uh, this is the obvious question. How do you ask about somebody's cancer, illness, disease? Yeah, I think it's really about asking if you can ask. Mm, The elephant in the room. Yeah, yeah. Saying like, if you're comfortable, I would love to know more about this experience because I I care about you and I'm curious about you. Um, And this seems like a big part of your life. And since I'm interested in being in your life, it feels it feels like something I'd like to know if you feel comfortable sharing it with me. Hey, I don't know how to talk about your disease. And if you're up for sharing with me, I'd love to know how I can check in with you. Yeah. What would you like me to hold? When you have cancer, there's so many ways someone can support you. It's hard because a lot of cancer patients don't know. I did a lot of work trying to figure out reading books, trying to figure out, okay, how do I do this? And what role of support do people need to, to play? Because I, I had a primary partner who dumped me a week after I got home from my hip replacement. Um, so I went from having a sole supporter, like my ultimate support network, to having nothing. And I couldn't walk. And so I had to learn how to ask for help. And cancer patients are notoriously bad at that. Like, you know, they will never ask for help and they need so much. So, by the way, yeah. Ouch. Yeah. Ouch. You dumped me. I, w- I was like, I can't even get up and walk away. Like, you need to get out. <laughs> I get it. Like, but ouch. I get it. I'm not, I'm not past the hurt yet. I'm not past the, the ouch yet. But, I I don't I don't think he's a bad guy. I just am not bad. So, oh my god! Could you have waited for a month later? <laughs> Some people can't. They just can't. No, they yeah, can't. They can't. they can't support you, and and that's fine. It's totally yeah, fine. Yeah, that's not, okay. Yeah, you might you might as well remove yourself now. Oh, totally. It was so painful. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. One of my favorite questions is, "How can I help?" Yeah. So basic. So basic. How can I? Oh, four words. And they're so small. They're such tiny little words. Yeah. (laughs) But they're very impactful. I like, do you need anything from me right now? I like that one a lot. Do you have any needs? Yeah. Do you have any needs? Is there anything I could do for you right now? Oof. That's a good one. These are such simple yet profoundly impactful questions. (sighs) I think I I read something interesting. I'm reading a book. Um, oh, I don't want to mess up who it is, so I'm not going to say. Don't fuck this up. I know. It's someone who writes cards for horrible illness. And they're very, they've blown up. You can buy them at like Paper Source or something. And they're awesome. They're every one. I just bought them for myself and acted like people sent them to me. I'm I'm checking the shelves and I cannot find it. But I found the book. The book is by... Emily McDowell. She's the she's the amazing crafter of these cards. See, now we've got we've got the right name. Yeah, there's no great card for this, is what the book is called. Um, but she describes what would a little kid say if they knew? And I think curiosity is the main thing. People just think, since I have breast cancer, like, oh my God, it's they're gonna hurt me. Something they'll ask will just destroy my day. And I, you have to take that thing that you have to trust that I believe you have to trust. I'm not going to take your curiosity, curiosity personally. And I think that's the kicker. And you have to trust that people can take care of themselves. Yeah. And I get it. People, I get it. Not that great at taking care of themselves sometimes. So bad. Most of the time. Yeah. So it can be scary, but also you just really have to trust that the, that the folks in your life can advocate for their needs. Totally. And you have to create an environment where they can. Right. 
And that's hard. We're not the best at that. I like how messy it is now, though. Which part? The, like, what can I do for you part? I like, I like that I, I like being the most damaged goods in the room because then I feel like I'm fearless about helping others, which is cool. Dang. It's kind of nice because, like, if someone's having crazy shit happen, they know my shit is crazier or they think it is, which a lot of the time I'm like, it isn't really right now. It's different. Type totally different yeah different volume for sure but people will have shit happen to them that is just out of this world and then they'll come to me so i have all these really awesome super deep friendships now where we share the gnarliest stuff that's happened to us and i can take care of them i can say can i pet your head you come over to my house and i can make you sparkling water and you can cuddle with my dog mm. we don't have to talk so i have I, f- I feel like a superhero in a, in a weird way, like a damaged superhero. But I think most superheroes start damaged. Yes, that's what makes them super. Yeah. Is because they take whatever has been the most challenging thing for them and they turn it into uh, a way to help people. Totally, totally. That's the power. That's the superpower is to harness that pain and turn it into love. Yeah. Yeah, I think for me, there were two big... This, I'm kind of jumping a little, but the swap from early stage to metastatic. When I got diagnosed with early stage, I walked out of the hospital freaking out and I thought, what's my make a wish? And my make a wish was to get a pug puppy. And I got one and it was great. Boom. Wish made. Boom. Pug puppy, wish made. And he's amazing. And I got another one recently and they're just the best little love bugs. They help so much. Two pugs. And then. Two pugs now. Yeah. Mustang is the newest little little baby. She's great. When one pug is not enough. Well, it's the co-parent thing. So I got the pug with my ex. And he, since I had chemo, he really took care of my Make-A-Wish pug. So it's kind of his pug. So now I have my own little pug. But we still, we still co-parent. It's cool. Okay. So that was, that was the early stage. And then I think when I got diagnosed with metastatic... There's just two thoughts that popped into my mind, like in the hospital being like, wow, I just have a terminal illness. I'm going to die from cancer. Wow. And the first thought that came into my head was, I live a really joyful life. That's how I live. I live joyfully. And that's still going to be true. There's n- that feels core to me. Gratitude is the thing that came up for you yeah yeah like i and then the other piece was um i'm really proud of the life i've lived Hmm. those two pieces became and then i started asking everyone those questions and that did not go well what questions are you joyful and are you proud of the life you've lived it didn't go well people said no a lot of people said no well which kind of and it was very funny because i had um shattered my hip at that point and was like bed bound and couldn't stand up. I had a walker and it was so crazy. I was so busted. Um, and I would ask people these questions and they would say no. And I'd be like, huh, my answer is yes. And they were so confused <laughs> about how that could be true for me. And you actually believe this. You're not just faking, faking it till you make it. Those two things. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like those were, they were like clear as day. Like I felt like the, all the storm cleared and those things were true to my core, hmm. which was cool. Yeah. And I think that's convinced me to stay alive, which is, which is nice. I'm glad that I have that confidence that if I stay alive, those things will be true. I'll continue to do things that make me proud and continue to be joyful. I'm, I'm glad you have that too. Oh, it's awesome. I wish every, when people didn't, it was very, it made me so sad. Yeah. Do you want to talk about how dating has been? Yeah. I think the funny stuff is like the guy who said, you're so fit for chemo. And I had a guy who we were just hooking up. It was one of those dates where like, you're just suffering through the talking just to get some ass, you know? Mm. I mean, I don't know if you know what... 
<laughs> I feel like everyone's kind of had that experience where you're like, I need to get laid. I know what you're talking about. I know that maybe it sucks to admit it, but I was having, as a woman, I feel very comfortable saying I had cancer. I wanted to get laid. Um, I was having the time where I, I was like, this man is very handsome. Uh, and I'm going to go home with him, even though he seems dumb as a pile of bricks. But I would like him to rail me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I, and it was like in a weird spot where sex was sort of uncomfortable. So I was like, I just want to get down to some kind of rolling around in the sack for a little bit. Right. See how it goes. And I took off, I was about to take off my shirt and my scar is, it's big. It's like, I don't know. There was, it was a bad healing. So I probably have like a quarter of the under of my breast, probably the under piece of my breast. Almost all of it is like all scar tissue. It's very noticeable. And as I took off my shirt, I was like, I, he knew I had cancer. And I said, I have kind of a big scar. And he said, that's okay. <laughs> I remember thinking, that's okay. Is a really weird response. <laughs> like that doesn't wreck this for me. And it was really, I, I had made out with him for like a half an hour. I was like, I gotta go. This is too weird. The that's okay. It was borderline. Okay. As a response. Yeah. Like it's fine that you're sort of damaged. I'll take, I don't, I couldn't, I couldn't wrap my brain. It wasn't like curious. It wasn't like, what was that like for you? It just said in this hookup setting, that's not a deal breaker for him. Like he'll continue fucking me. Yeah. Right. With said scar. That's right. I can, I can still get hard. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Your scar is not gonna wreck my ability to get off. That's okay. He was actually probably just talking. He was like talking himself into it. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> oh, oh, so that one was brutal. And then when I got diagnosed with the terminal illness, like when it escalated, I realized before I felt comfortable saying I have cancer really early on, because a I couldn't. I wasn't passing. I wasn't cancer free passing for a long time because I had no hair. So, and your nails weren't attached to your body anymore. Yeah, my nails weren't attached to my body. I had, I was in menopause. I had all this shit that was like not hideable. And then when I became, you know, stage four, I, I had hair. I shattered my hip. That was true, but that was a fun Burning Man story. So I could kind of play that off as, I fell off a bike at Burning Man, which was true. And so I, I could go for a few dates without people knowing. And that was very interesting. What year did you shatter your hip at Burning Man? Last year. Oh, that was the one year I took off. Yeah, it was wild. I'm sure it was. <laughs> I got air evacuated. You better have. Yeah. And they told me in the hospital, they were like, if we don't, do this angiogram, you'll die. And I was like, I feel like you shouldn't tell people that. I feel like you should just do the angiogram. Yeah. Is there, oh, I'm. let me just think about this one real quick. Okay, go ahead. I, I, I looked at my friend and said, did this man just say that to me? Like, why are we not rushing? In ER, they're not like, do you want to live like in the show? You know, they just, they just do it. I it think so it's, weird. you know, because they, there's a big bill at the end. Maybe they were totally. giving, they were giving you, you the right. option. Yeah. You could just die debt free or <laughs> might not be debt free, but you won't have to worry about it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that was last year. And I, and it took me six months to learn how to walk again. And I could walk really ugly. And I, I went on some dates with crutches and they just never went anywhere. And I, I don't know if that's because of, I think it was really just not a great connection for a while. But I started dating someone recently where it is like where we got past the first or second date. And then I was in an interesting spot because there's this question of when do you tell people you have like a terminal disease? And so I, I came up with a strategy that I thought was pretty funny. I'm, I'm someone who approaches almost everything with humor. And so I, I wanted to be comfortable and I didn't want to, it's such a heavy thing. And it also feels so normal to me. Like it doesn't feel like a heavy thing. 
And I struggle with people mourning me when I'm alive. That's extremely painful for me. And so I didn't want to put this delightful uh, human in that position. So I, I said, <laughs> can we talk about, we were rolling around in the sack and I said, you know, can we take a break to talk about STIs? And power move, by the way. Good, good one. Yeah, I know. It was so good. I was like, I usually like to keep my clothes on before we have this conversation, but I felt, I felt really solid about my moves and we had the talk and I love that talk so much. I love the conversations. I love normalizing everything. It was awesome. And then at the end, after we kind of decided our, our testing strategy and our boundaries with regards to that evening, I said, okay, now, now I'd love to talk about CTDs. And he was like, what's a CTD? And I was like, a chronic terminal disease. <laughs> wow. Um, because I didn't know, just, I didn't know how to intro. Like, okay, now that we've talked about herpes, let's talk about breast cancer. <laughs> yeah, and I told him I had metastatic breast cancer, and and it was really sweet. He he listened, and then he actually like cried a bit, which was awesome. It felt really, it felt really genuine. Like it didn't feel like he was crying for himself or anything. It felt just like a very sweet response to very serious news. It was very vulnerable to do that, I think, too. Like, he leaned in. He didn't pull back. And then I, you know, I told him it was scary to tell him that. And he said, why was it scary? And I said, well, because I imagine a lot of people would, that's scary news to hear. Like, I imagine it would change a lot of people's interest in me. And he he is so sweet. He's like, oh, it definitely doesn't change my interest in seeing you, which was awesome to hear. And that was, that was it. And now we just, now I can talk about this huge elephant in the room kind of casually in this way that he can be curious about. And I think there's something to waiting until people have a sense of who you are before dropping the, the C-bomb. And it paid off. It, it worked really well. It was great. We like this guy. Oh, he's in. He's such a, he's a dreamboat. He's a dreamboat. Yeah. We went plant shopping the other day. I was like, oh, you are my dream man. Was was uh, this the last time you've had the CTD talk? Yeah. This is the first time I've had it. So I've never, I haven't went on a date where I've been on like a second date and never told the person. Yeah. I've went on a lot of dates. It's very funny because I feel like when I was dating before, I had a primary partner and so I had a pretty good um good measure for when to get out like I wasn't desperately dating so if a if a first date was like meh I just wouldn't go on another whereas when I've been single and not had a primary partner I tend to go on more dates cuz there's a little more desperation in the process and sometimes you need a second date to yeah to figure it out figure it out and so, so now that I have a, like a, having breast cancer is kind of like having a primary partner in the sense that when I go on a first date and it's, and they don't ask me any questions about myself and they just talk about themselves the entire time. I'm like, okay, moving on. Not a good fit. Not a good fit. Not a good fit. How about this? How about after you talk about STIs, you could say, and now I'd like to talk to you about non-sexually transmitted illnesses oh yeah non-sexually transmitted i think that would be great but i think the terminal piece is very important for people uh, yeah but maybe you could say actually transmitted terminal diseases <laughs> I, I feel like you can you can drop the t-bomb after you drop the bc bomb i usually do the mbc the metastatic breast cancer and then People who are hip know that's terminal, and people who aren't, I can lay it out. You would you would have had to lay it out for me. That it's terminal, yeah. yeah. Stage four, terminal. Bam, bam. Stage four, I get. Stage four, yeah. I get. That one's pretty clear. We all we most people know. We all know stage four is death. I guess metastatic. You don't think it's stage four? Well, metastatic doesn't that mean that it like spreads throughout your body? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and that's always stage four, right? I don't even know. I mean, don't ask me. I'm, I, <laughs> I'm not a doctor. In, can in breast cancer land, it's always 
Metastatic is stage four. I'm not a doctor. I'm also not a ther- <laughs> I'm not a therapist either. Oh, totally. I just yeah. need I need people to know that every now and then I have to remind people. Not a therapist. I love that. That's that's something you get now. That's just because you you're so in the know, huh? It's fun. My therapist and I were talking about. She she goes, yeah. Well, you know, now that you're in the helping profession, ah, we profession. yeah, we were talking about what we have in common, and I, she felt ah. a little bit. It, strangely enough, like a colleague. Oh, she was talking to me right. about these like mental health concepts to help ah. me in my coaching practice. Whoa! Yeah, I get I get a lot of therapists who have said to me, "It is insane how you are compared." Like they are basically telling me I'm a I'm a personal mental health bodhisattva compared to the folks they talk to. A what? A uh, bodhisattva. I often joke about being a bodhisattva. What's that? A bodhisattva is like in Buddhism. Once you reach like a level of enlightenment, you become a bodhisattva. Oh, cool. So, you know, I, I had a shattered hip and my therapist was coming to my house to do therapy because I couldn't walk um, to her. And I was sitting there and I was telling her how awesome it was to see hummingbirds outside my window and the bottle brush tree and just how beautiful they were. And she was like, I can't believe that you can have gratitude. <laughs> like you're, Long-term partner dumped you. <laughs> you shagged your hip. You got a terminal diagnosis and you're talking about the fucking hummingbirds. I was like, oh, is that weird? And she's like, yeah, it's pretty weird. Well, and the most devastating part of that whole story and everything that you have been through is that you had to leave Burning Man early. Oh, I was there for 18 hours. I mean, that's, that is the most devastating and I flew in on an airplane. Like I was sparkle pony princess status. I could be famous right now. Who flies into Burning Man on a plane and flies out in a helicopter? <laughs> it's actually a tiny medical plane, not a helicopter. Oh, it was a little medical plane. Yeah. Because hmm. I think that my body wouldn't have fit in a helicopter. I don't know. Maybe uh... helicopters are hard to get in and out of Burning Man. No, they they have helicopters there, but you had a plane. That's okay. I had a plane. I had a plane. Yeah. Are we missing anything? What are we? Do we need to touch on anything? Oh, I can't have. I have. I'm in menopause forever. Oh yeah, I was going to ask you that. Can you not get pregnant? Turns out that some people. So I have my ovaries shut off, but I've heard other people who are in my situation have gotten pregnant with their ovaries shut off, and they were just like fist to the heavens, pissed. Yeah, you got to be careful. Yeah, you got. I, I'm not. I'm. I'm like not about to mess with that. You don't want to have to have get an abortion. Have an abortion? That would be so shitty. <laughs> or have or have the also have the kid. People do, and people die for to keep their kid alive. Often. Oof, I don't know if I could do that. I'm not in that boat. Yeah, I'm on the no baby train, and I feel like now I have a really good excuse for not having a baby. I always have been on the no baby train. But the interesting piece of it is I am in menopause in this way that I am going through all of the like vaginal atrophy that older women have to deal with. Can you just tell me a little bit about that? Because I was talking to somebody at Kripalu who was worried about this particular thing and I couldn't speak to it. Oh, they should be worried. It's horrible. Wait, no, don't say that. Um, I know I feel bad about it. So. What would I say? I would say that <laughs> I I also am in a unique situation because not my cancer grows with estrogen. So they turn off my ovaries forever so that no estrogen can fuel my cancer in my body. Pills? And uh, that's a shot, actually. It's Lupron. Lupron, which is actually curious because it's they use it for fertility drugs too. But for me, it's a different utility. Strange. I know, so weird. You're like, how could it be for shutting off your ovaries and making eggs to have babies? I don't get it, but whatever. Uh, Bodies. I know. Drugs, bodies, weird. And then I also take a drug to stop my peripheral tissues. So fat cells make estrogen, which I don't know if you knew that, but that's something I discovered that fat cells make a lot of estrogen. So there's this awkward thing where we have to talk about 
weight when you have breast cancer. They're like, you really want to stay slim because if you get a lot of fat cells, they'll make estrogen and that puts you at higher risk for recurrence. Hmm. Which is, I'm just like, come on, guys. I think I knew, I knew that about fat cells and estrogen. Huh. Well, I didn't know that. And so I'd also take a drug to turn off all that estrogen. And what that means is my pussy is very sad. Um, In terms of like looking? Sad looking. <laughs> feeling? It's not both. I think feeling, I guess looking like it's not that's really important to bring blood to that area. Right. Vitality. Vitality. So I have kind of like a, you know, when people joke about dusty old lady pussies, it's not a very nice joke. No, it's not nice, but it's not dusty. No, it's not. I mean, but it's not, it's not gooey. That's for sure. It's not gooey. Right, 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 right. But it's definitely not dusty. It doesn't lubricate as no. well or at, as well. As well. And then it also shrinks. So now I'm looking for just, I'm like, bring on all the tiny penises. I'm excited about it. It shrinks? Yeah, you get atrophy. So it actually shrinks. Does that mean you need to work it out more? Yeah, that means there's these things called dilators and you're supposed to just shove like a dildo into your bits uh, and hang out with it while you watch TV or something. Or what about just lots of big penetration? You could do that, but it's not about the thing about it's not an in and out thing. It's you go in and it's kind of like it reminds me of like anal training where you try to like relax the asshole progressively over time. It's kind of like that. So penetration makes it hard because your body's like, no, like mm. I'm closing the gates. And then if you do that, your body actually remembers that trauma. Right. And makes it harder in the future. So it's not about that. It's about putting a dilating dildo in. Yeah, just chilling with the dilate. And it's also about like, I make these cute little coconut suppositories that I sleep with every night to kind of keep keep the bits lubricated. Coconut oil is like all about, my life is just covered in coconut oil. Yeah, I mean, it's, I think we're destroying the planet, but you know. I know, and I feel bad about that, but then I think I'm not going to be around for always. So sorry, guys. I get it. I, I get it. And- <laughs> I don't think anyone can blame you for that. Yeah. <laughs> like, come for me. My environmental protection has gone way. Environmental advocacy has become kind of backseat to keeping this little bot alive. Yeah. And also quality of life. Yeah. Yeah. Quality of life is important to me. But yeah, so I, I'm curious. I haven't actually had sex, vaginal intercourse, since this new atrophy phase. So... I just, I'm curious to see how it will be to explore that with someone. And I'm curious if that's going to be a deal breaker. Like if penis vagina time can't happen, will people be happy with the alternatives? I'm curious. That's sort of the next question, the next level. What about plant daddy? Plant daddy, we have, we've rolled around, but we're still waiting on testing to do the, to do the thing. Oh, nice. Yeah. That's how we do. Come on, that's extremely responsible. I know. I also have started dating one of my exes. We're having like a a renaissance. And I it's great because I love him and he loves me. We're like forever people. And so I I can express to him like I'm really afraid I'm not going to be able to handle your 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 stuff. And he'll say like we can just cuddle. I don't care. It's about closeness with you. So he's really safe. Does he have a sizable member? He doesn't have like an outrageously sizable member. Like I've had dicks that I'm like, I could never know you again. But he has like, I think his is feasible. Like, I think it's feasible that I could have sex with him. I hope so. Yeah, I hope so too. The hard part is I love penetration. Mm. And like, so I have to kind of, if it's painful, I have to learn how to, enjoy sex again which is exciting i guess yeah in different ways yeah it's sex is varied i know and since i'm into kink it's like so much broader than it used to be yeah you can get all sorts of tied up and and all sorts of things totally i have one final question for you yeah what is it what does love mean to you love means to me 
that depth of connection and the trust to really show yourself to someone. Like when you're willing to share who you actually are with someone and you trust they're going to hold that truth with sweetness, that feels like love to me. Mm. That's fantastic. Yeah. Hope you have penetrative sex soon. Oh God, I'm excited. I'm nervous. I'm excited. (laughs) Thank you for sharing. Yeah. This is so fun. I really appreciate it. I appreciate your vulnerability and your willingness to show up and talk about something that most people probably don't have a lot of experience listening to or knowing about. I'm curious what people will think. Well, people, let us know what you think. Sean at thelovedrive.com. Yeah, and it's so nice to connect with you again. I'll share all those messages with you, Jenny. Thanks. Thanks, Deluxe. (laughs) As always, you know that I am so grateful that you decided to spend this time with me and Jenny today. Thanks. Thank you so much. And surprise, I've got a book list coming out soon. I'm almost ready to release it. And if you want to find out about it, you want to find out about the book list and you want to find out about my upcoming group coaching program for 12 people only. Sign up to the email list and you will be the first to find out. All this stuff happens on email. Go to thelovedrive.com forward slash newsletter and sign up. I've got a group coaching program coming up for October, November. I've got a book list of all my favorite books that you can have for free. Um, You can't have the books. You can have the list of the books. (laughs) Anyways thelovedrive.com forward slash newsletter. I will send you all that as soon as it is released. Thank you. Have a beautiful week.